Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, brought to you today by Ernest. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis. And Jim, the good martini is that hopefully we're going to do a much better job of getting more people vaccinated for the coronavirus and all these head-to-desk slamming episodes that we've been having over the past few weeks after cheering this amazing accomplishment of getting the vaccine done in the same calendar year that the pandemic really got going. But uh, then the rollout got clogged up. And of course, uh, every state and locality is trying to blame the federal government. But, uh, you know, you guys had a lot of time to figure this out, too. Everybody was trying to get the... uh, the pecking order right and who ought to get it first and now the cdc is just saying you know what let's just get it out there uh with some parameters still in place but here's what axios says the trump administration is set to deliver new guidelines today that will get coronavirus vaccinations moving much faster new federal guidelines will recommend opening up the process to everyone older than 65 and will also aim to move doses out the door rather than holding some back so here are the details Uh, The CDC recommending that states open the vaccination process again to everyone older than 65 and to adults of all ages who have a pre-existing condition that puts them at greater risk for serious infection. They also want to expand the venues where people can get vaccinated to include community health centers and more pharmacies and getting all the available doses out the door now. Both of the authorized vaccines require two shots. The government will no longer hold back doses for the second shot but will instead try to get today's doses into people's arms now, trusting that supplies will increase rapidly enough to provide second shots. And Jim, since those need to be spaced out fairly precisely, uh, this whole backlog with uh, vaccinations uh, adds a whole nother frustrating dimension here. So uh, the CDC is uh, trying to clear the road here of all this uh, gridlock, and hopefully it'll work. Yeah, dear listeners, not every conversation that goes on in my life ends up getting reflected here in the Three Martini Lunch podcast. But so you just have to trust me when I say offline, I've been having impassioned arguments with certain people saying that the CDC and various state health organizations and health officials should just be opening this up, ideally to as many people as possible, but at minimum to the elderly and at minimum to people who are at higher risk. Because all of the anecdotes about the ideas of certain doses being wasted is maddening. Um, In Virginia, the state took a long time sorting through who would fit into the categories 1A, 1B, 1C um, for for the prioritization. By the way, you know what might have been even simpler, Greg, than 1A, 1B, and 1C? One, <laughs> one, two, and three. Does that make you know, like you? Because know, now we're all now we got to go alphabetically. Now it's all that kind of stuff. And the, the the state of Virginia spent at least a few weeks sorting this out. Weeks they could have been vaccinating people, but they had to sink through. Hey, well, you know, let's make sure who's who. Wait, which diseases get you on this list, and which ones for that? You know, this is this is all maddening. It's all going way slower than it was projected. Um, it's absolutely inexcusable. You know, right now my wife is trying to find uh, uh, vaccination dates for her parents who are getting up there in years. Um, uh, apparently my parents w- down in South Carolina will be able to apply for a time fairly certain. You probably have heard the story about up in New York where um, a pl- getting a reservation for a, uh, a, a vaccination, you have a 51-step process online, 51 pieces of information are needed. You need to scan in documents and send them into the state and to the state health officials. Greg, you know, look, you get up in years, some things get a little more challenging. There are certain senior citizens I don't want to leave. We're going to have problems with the remote control. The idea of them going through this 51-step process to make a reservation is asinine and demonstrates that these people do not think through how these plans are going to you know, work when they're actually tried to be used by actual human beings. So I'm very glad that the CDC is now saying what some of us have been saying for a while. Greg, I will resist the urge. No, I won't. I will, I will quote the wisest philosopher in the history of Western civilization, one John McClain, when he said, welcome to the party, pal. This is, this is a, a, it's been a frustrating delay. Hopefully this gets things on the right direction. I think, dear listeners, if you have the opportunity to get vaccinated, take that opportunity. If the people who are running these vaccination stations have a couple of doses left and it's the end of the day and somebody didn't show up for an appointment, Find somebody off the street and say, hey, you want to get vaccinated? It's your lucky day. Come on in. Use them all. Um, There's no excuse for this. And if this ends up with certain younger people getting vaccinated before certain older people or certain healthier people getting, like, I'm okay with that. 
I will take that because each person who gets vaccinated gets us one step closer to herd immunity. So, you know, I, I want flexibility. I want adaptability. I do not want people be lawyering this thing to death. And the CDC instructions today are hopefully a significant step in the right direction. The idea of people that I know in older generations trying to figure out how to scan and attach documents to a 51 field form might be the most perfect encapsulation of bureaucratic incompetence and uh, not understanding who they're dealing with that I've heard of in a long time. There's been a lot of bureaucratic head slapping going on in this whole process, but that one might take the cake. But again, let's focus on the good here. They're trying to streamline this, get get shots to more people, and, and hopefully that will ease things up. Uh, but uh, as long as there are bureaucrats running the show, there are going to be some headaches here. But uh, uh, who knows who they'll blame for that. Well, let's talk about Ernest, uh, because one of the things that you'll want to be in better shape with uh, when we come out of this pandemic, or really any time, is to not be dealing with that student debt. You might be counting on Joe Biden to help you a little bit with that, uh, but uh, for a lot of folks, it's going to take a lot more than that. And it's time to break out of the student debt cycle, and Earnest can help you by refinancing that student loan. Earnest offers low-rate student loan refinancing, and you can check your rate risk-free in just two minutes. With Earnest, you get radically flexible payments, and you can pick your own loan term. By refinancing, you can reduce your loan term, save money, or combine multiple loans into a simple monthly payment. And if you have questions, you can even talk to a real live human being at Earnest for help. Isn't it time you stopped feeling overwhelmed by your student debt? A real life human. They still have those. That's awesome. So Ernest is offering three Martini Lunch listeners a $100 cash bonus. You can refinance your student debt at Ernest, E-A-R-N-E-S-T dot com slash Martini. Terms and conditions apply. Ernest Student Loan Refinancing made by Ernest Operations, LLC, NMLS number 1204917. California Financing Law License number 6054788. 303 2nd Street, Suite 401N, San Francisco, California, 94107. Visit earnest.com slash licenses for a full list of licenses. Always good to get the legal in there, Jim. You got to speed up your voice there. <laughs> Next time. I think they're with us tomorrow, too. So tomorrow, I'll sound more like the FedEx guy from the early 80s. But uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But uh, all right. Let's talk about our uh, bad martini now, Jim. And uh, we like free speech in this country. In fact, it's uh, one of the big ones in the First Amendment, uh, in the Bill of Rights. And uh, in the wake of the riots on Capitol Hill, social media and big tech cracking down in some significant ways. The biggest headline, of course, was that President Trump was deplatformed from Twitter and Facebook and pretty much everywhere. He might still have uh, access in a couple different places. I think he even tried to use the POTUS account and then that got shut down. Uh, then Parler got knocked off of the App Store for Apple from uh, Google's apps, and then Amazon Web Services knocked it off as well. And so the idea out there certainly is that uh, anything associated with an issue that was supported by folks at the rally that turned into the riots needs to be uh, taken off because it could incite public violence. And so there's a lot of folks who believe now that the, the war on any speech that differs with the liberal orthodoxy is pretty much going to be silenced now. It looks like Parler has found a new host site, and they're going to be back on within a number of days here, Jim. But uh, a lot of folks find it chilling. Others say, look, some of these sites, particularly Parler, were very reluctant to curtail any speech, uh, including threats of violence. I think most people would agree that you should allow as much speech as possible. But, but when people are calling for the deaths of certain people or let's go burn down that guy's house, that's probably a line that ought not to be crossed. So what do you make about what we're seeing and where we ought to be with this? You know, what I think of this depends a great deal on what the actual facts on the ground are. And right now we've got two conflicting accounts here. If Apple, if Apple and Amazon Web Services are correct, that threats to, to kill public officials, to kill uh, liberals and, and to all that stuff, if, if they really were on Parler and they, Parler was really doing nothing about it, and if they've been called to the attention of the management of Parler and Parler had either done nothing or was clearly dragging its feet, um, then, then, yeah, then Parler had it coming. I, I don't think there's anybody who would say a, uh, any social media platform should allow threats of violence to remain up on its platform. I, I think that's a, a um, particularly in light of what we've seen, particularly what we saw, what we saw this summer, calling for somebody to go out and kill someone else. Sorry, nope, that's verboten. That, you know, 
Um, this is not a matter of like, you know, the First Amendment and incitement in the a jury box. This is a question of what do you as a social media company want to be on your platform? And oh, by the way, yes, you guys are publishers in the sense that you decide what appears in your pages, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what is okay to publish and what is not okay to publish. And it would be very nice if the big tech companies could stop doing this two-step in which they insist, oh no, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're just a tech company. We don't actually get involved in publication. You can't be treating us like that. Also, we are a media company and we get to decide what gets published. But even beyond, if, if, what, if what Apple and Amazon Web Services are saying are true, then sorry, Parler, I have no sympathy for what you're doing. If Parler really did attempt to get this stuff down, or if they didn't know about this stuff. Like, I, I'm a little frustrated that from Parler, what I'm hearing is a great deal about big tech censoring them. I'm not hearing much of anything from them about what their good faith efforts were to take down these sorts of comments. Because it's enti- I, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Way back in the old days, I used to talk to Don, Dan Bongino, back when he was an expert on you know, so, uh, secret service issues and stuff like that. If it's a good faith effort, then yeah, this is a big tech crackdown. This is a ludicrous, uh, uh, this, and there's been enough cases of Twitter and Facebook and other big social media companies taking down content that is conservative and let's, you know, usually controversial. Usually it's a little hot, usually gets into a, a, a gray area or something inflammatory, but not doing the same to things on the left. Uh, I think, you know, Twitter gave Trump a, a whole bunch of warnings uh, you know, one warning label after another slapped onto his, twe- onto his tweets. He can't be surprised that Twitter said, that's it. That's your third strike. You're out. You're off our platform. But I can't help but notice that the Ayatollah of Iran is still on Twitter. I can't help but notice the various Chinese government spokesmen are still on Twitter. It was a new extended campaign to get Louis Farrakhan to lose his blue check mark from Twitter. Uh, by the way, the blue check mark allegedly was simply a verification that this account is indeed connected to the public figure uh, that, is, that it's named after to avoid people from dif- differentiating between real accounts and fake accounts, someone impersonating someone else. Parkon's still up there. And it, the look at the content on his feed and what he says about Jews and things like that. I can't easily argue that it's better than what anything Trump did. So if you're going to get rid of Trump, people don't really have that much of a problem with Twitter, the, the standards that these social media companies say they enforce. They have a problem with the enforcement that appears to be much more strictly enforced on one side of the aisle than the other. Um, as for Parler, look, if they really made a good faith effort to take down threats and things like that, this should be a no-brainer. Amazon Web Services and Apple should say, oh, you were trying to take that stuff down. Okay, everybody's being reasonable here. Everybody's trying to protect people's right to express themselves, but also not uh, encourage, tolerate, or turn a blind eye towards threats of violence and things like that. There are certain people in this world who like being victims, who like claiming that they're being oppressed. If Parler made this genuine effort, put it out there, world, and I think the whole world would sympathize with Parler. But if Parler did not take quick steps to take down these threats, and if they did turn a blind eye to these sort of things, or a, a wink and a nod, or some sort of casual acceptance of this kind of language on their site, then we should, uh, I, I, can't, I can't begrudge Amazon Web Services or Apple for wanting nothing to do with a company that you know, looks at comments like that and you know, shrugs and doesn't think it's a big deal. Two quick follow-ups here, Jim. First of all, uh, I believe, at least this is what I'm hearing, that some folks were taken off of Twitter. I don't know about permanently, but certainly uh, suspended. Uh, folks like Tom Fitton over at Judicial Watch, who uh, obviously is one of those who believed that the election was not legitimate, and you can have whatever position you want on the on the election. But there's there's a belief out there that some folks are being taken off of social media because they still believe that. Whether they're right or not uh, is kind of irrelevant. You should still have the right to believe that. But some folks are now equating disputing the results of the election with being promoters of violence as a result of what happened on Wednesday. So that gets into a very sticky area. Also, on the other side, Lynn Wood uh, is now being investigated by the Secret Service because of death threats he made against Mike Pence. Uh, He was banned from Twitter last week and is also suspected of writing a now deleted post on Parler uh, that says, quote, get the firing squads ready. Pence goes first. Uh, That's about as blatant as it goes. I'm not sure that he had specific plans to go kill people, but it certainly is uh, heading in a a, a direction that can only be considered as uh, dangerous. Uh, And then he also had a tweet, Jim, which is more 
pathetic than anything else than probably dangerous. But he said he's only 10 to 14 days away from really blowing the lid on Mike Pence and all these other people who are part of the uh, child trafficking. So the grift and the con still goes on with this guy. Hopefully he's scrubbed from the public stage as soon as possible. You know, the same about hard cases make bad law. There's also a philosophy that says the First Amendment is not there to protect normal speech or non-controversial speech. The First Amendment is there to protect very controversial speech. And particularly, my guess would be, you know, very controversial speech about political figures. That said, get the firing squad ready. Pence is fur. Like, you know, the Secret Service has every reason to investigate something like that. Sure. Yep. And I, I, what's frustrating is that the routine, I think the election was stolen. I don't think that statement in and of itself is a crime. I don't think that statement in and of itself should be sufficient to get you kicked off a social media platform. It's wrong. It's factually incorrect. But if being wrong and factually incorrect was enough to get you kicked off social media, nobody in our elected office would ever be up there. <laughs> um, and so there's this blurring of the lines. And so the question is, does a Lynn Wood type get kicked off for saying the election was stolen and, and you know, stuff like that? Or does he get kicked off for saying, get the firing squad ready? Because I think there's a world of difference between those two motivations. Uh, you know, one is an annoyance and something that needs to be refuted with fact checking and verifiable facts and, and all of that. And the other one is like, no, no, you're calling on people to kill other people. Get off this platform. No, absolutely right. I don't know what happened to Lynn Wood, but it's, it's ugly. It's scary. It's sad and maybe prosecutable. We'll see. Hey guys, it's Mock and Daisy from Chicks on the Right. We're excited to tell you about our podcast, the Mock and Daisy Common Sense Cast. From discussing topics like cancel culture, what's happening to our new generations, crises in our nation, and even some high profile interviews, each week we touch on subjects that matter to us and matter to you. And we're not afraid to tell you how it is. So tune in every week to hear us talk about the things or even just get a good laugh. To find out more, go to our website, chicksontheright.com, or start listening on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Don't forget to leave a comment, a review, and subscribe. All right, let's move on to our final martini, Jim. And this is on the lighter side, but it does suggest where we might be headed media-wise here for the next uh, few years. ABC News. This is the third day of this story, by the way. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris has landed on the cover of the February issue of Vogue magazine. But her team says there's a problem. The shot of the country's soon-to-be number two leader isn't what both sides had agreed upon, her team says. Instead of the powder blue power suit that Harris wore for her cover shoot, the first African-American woman elected vice president is instead seen in more casual attire and wearing Converse Chuck Taylor sneakers, which she sometimes wore on the campaign trail. Harris's team was unaware that the cover photo had been switched until images leaked late Saturday, according to a person involved in the negotiations over how Harris would be featured on the cover. Harris's office declined comment, and the person spoke Sunday on condition of anonymity. In a statement, Vogue said it went with the more informal image of Harris for the cover because the photo captured her, quote, authentic, approachable nature, which we feel is one of the hallmarks of the Biden-Harris administration. But the magazine said it released both images as digital magazine covers to respond, quote, to the seriousness of this moment in history and the role she has to play leading our country forward. Jim, authentic is not a word I would use to describe Kamala Harris, but uh, what do you make of the fact that uh, she's getting this glowing, fawning profile, obviously, in vogue, and yet they can't be happy with it because it's not the photo they agreed upon. I don't even know they negotiated these sorts of things, but uh, why is this still a story? Yeah, it's day three, and in other news, America... The U.S. Capitol Police told members of Congress that purchasing a bulletproof vest is a deductible business expense. Like, you know, I, I feel like we got bigger fish to fry. That said, I, I will make one, one or two minute observations. The first is, uh, as she is the first African-American, Indian-American woman to be vice president, if they did lighten her using Photoshop or some sort of editing software, it does not escape me why an African-American would be irked by that aesthetic decision. Um, that does strike me as a genuine effort. By the way, to then, by the way, to say we chose that edited photo as a tribute to her authenticity. Well, that's, that's you know, irony that I suppose even Anna Winter could, uh, could choke on. Uh, but yeah, it all the, in the great, particularly when a time like this, when much more big and serious problems are shaking in the country, the Kamala Harris fan base looks kind of ridiculous right now to be worrying that much about this. You know, like, and the idea that she's a serious leader, a serious politician, somebody who's ready to be a heartbeat away from the presidency and tackle all this, it's not doing her any favors for there to be this giant online 
kerfuffle about the Vogue cover. I thought I don't think it's that. Actually, it's not a great photo of her. There are better photos of her, but for whatever reason, Vogue went with that. Greg, do you think we have, do you think we have any sleeper agents in there? No. We're secretly trying to make Kabbalah Harris look bad or something like that? I, I mean, maybe it's a it. terrible aesthetic decision, but like I, half the time I look at the cover of Vogue while I'm buying other real magazines at the newsstand, uh, you know, not impressed with the cover photo. So, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I think it's a, a bizarre thing to be obsessed about. I do kind of wonder if at some point problems in the world get so severe, pandemic, economic problems, uh, poverty, addiction, you know, all gets so severe that people decide, you know what the problem is? The problem is, is that Latinos are called Latinos. And if we can just get people to call them Latinx, <laughs> our, our, you know, the world would be a better place. Well, not really. <laughs> That's not going to make a darn bit of difference in most people's lives as they live it. But, uh, but you feel like you did something. And that's, that's what a lot of our politics has become, entirely symbolic gestures. I feel like the fight over the Vogue cover is like almost as if they deliberately picked the most inconsequential and unimportant thing to fight about because the real world outside our windows has gotten too scary to deal with. But hey, at least tomorrow's Friday, Greg. <laughs> Well, media, get ready. Your coverage over the next four years will never be glowing enough. Because remember, one of uh, the Biden campaign's top communications people is now going to be one of the top communications people in the White House, Kate Bedingfield, who I always want to call Natasha. But uh, Kate Bedingfield has not bring a pocket full of sunshine anywhere. And she she was the one back during the campaign basically telling reporters to stop covering things. So uh, good luck. Good luck, Fourth Estate. I'm sure you won't have any trouble with that. You know, if they're going to complain about everything, you might as well call them as you see them. A lot of us figured this out a long time ago. (laughs) Oh, Jim, it's good to laugh. And I haven't laughed this hard since last night when Ohio State got crushed by Alabama. But uh, it's good to have some football news go your way. Anyway, congratulations to Alabama. And Jim, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Do not forget about our sponsors over at earnest.com slash martini to help refinance that student loan. Also, please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast. Uh, we appreciate your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Also, get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Have a great day, and we'll see you on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit danaradio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.